Hey everybody, it's Taryn. As I have been praying for the families who are suffering in Israel, the Lord has given me a word to share and a couple of passages from Scripture. Now when the Lord gives me passages from Scripture to share, sometimes they are a direct application of biblical prophecy to current events, and sometimes they are merely figuratively relevant as the thoughts and attitudes of God's heart and perspective. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And it says in his word in Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun. And so I pray that God gives you the wisdom to split the difference. But what I am going to read from the book of Isaiah today has both partially fulfilled prophecy and prophecy to be fulfilled in the future when it was written. And if you have any questions, feel free always to message me through my blog at gospelinthegarden.com. And I'd encourage you to subscribe there as well as I can share more liberally on there than I can on this platform. The prophetic utterance that the Lord gave me regarding Israel in prayer as Palestine is ambushing the West Bank was these words in Hebrew and I will also write them in the comments below so you can see how they are spelled and look them up in Strong's Concordance or elsewhere for yourself to garner the meaning. The first word he gave me is shul which means synagogue. The next one is Aya, which is the ruin heap. It means the ruin heap and is believed to currently be at the location called Etel on the West Bank. Ta, truth. Yaka, to convict, appoint, or chasten. And Moya, which means bitter rebellion. And this particular word, Moya, was coming to me over and over and over again, meaning bitter rebellion. So we have synagogue, the city of the ruin heap, truth, convict, appoint and chasten, and bitter rebellion. Aya was a place in central Canaan, and it's first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 12:8 as a place where Abram camped during his journey toward the land that God promised in Genesis 12:1, which reads, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. When Abram reached Aya, he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. And the name Aya means heap of ruins. See Joshua 8:28. According to Joshua 7.2, Aya was a Canaanite city located approximately two miles east of Bethel, and the ruins of the city now lie beneath the modern archaeological site of Atel on a slope leading from the Jordan Valley to Bethel, and it's notable for being the scene of a humiliating Israelite defeat, as the small city of Aya routed the Israelites and inflicted three dozen casualties, and the loss of the loss at Aya was due to the sin of Achan in Joshua 7, 1-5. In direct defiance of God's command to keep nothing for themselves from the wicked city of Jericho, Achan had kept a robe, 200 shekels of silver, and a 50 shekel bar of gold and hid it all in a hole he had dug within his tent. Achan kept his theft a secret until Israel was defeated at Aya. God then revealed to Joshua the cause for this defeat, and Achan, his family, and everything he owned was destroyed at God's command. See Joshua 7. Once the sin had been purged from the camp and Achan had been punished, God gave Joshua victory over Aya. After drawing the men of Aya out of the city and ambushing them, Israelite warriors captured the king and brought him to Joshua, who impaled him and left his body on public display as a testament to Israel's great triumph over the enemies of the Lord. The body of the king of Aya was left hanging until evening, at which time it was thrown in the gate of Aya and piled over with rocks. After first tasting the terrible defeat at Aya due to hidden sin, 
Israel learned about the power of purging sin from their midst so that the Lord could fight for them. The region around Aya became part of the land given to the tribe of Benjamin in the distribution of the promised land, according to Ezra 2.28. Aya was the second Canaanite city taken by Israel in its conquest of the promised land, the first being the great victory at the Battle of Jericho. And the prophet Isaiah mentions a rebuilt Aya in Isaiah 10.28, calling it Ayath. So we see this pattern over and over again with Israel and with many nations. Obedience followed by victory. Obedience to God followed by victory. Victory followed by blessing. Blessing followed by pride and disobedience to God. Disobedience followed by defeat. Defeat followed by judgment. Judgment by God followed by repentance. Then repentance followed by obedience. And obedience followed by victory. And we see this cycle over and over again throughout the Bible. And if we think about it, much of our own lives as well, as individuals, as we become proud and self-confident, God humbles us often through pain and suffering and the handing over to oppression in order to call us to repentance, obedience, deliverance, freedom, and victory. He says in his word that it's his loving kindness that brings us to repentance. And it is still true that God's loving kindness is calling Israel to repentance today. And if judgment begins in the house of God, then other nations will be soon to follow. God's grief is so great about what is happening in Israel. His grief is so great about the barbaric atrocities. And he is equally grieved at the infidelity and idolatry and rebellion and the turning away of his people who he loves against him. Specifically, the rejection of the Messiah, Yahushua HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Let's turn to Isaiah 1 to hear how God has spoken to Israel in the past while they were being chastened. And again, the Lord is chastening Israel according to the prophetic utterance that I received. Yaka is the word for chasten and conviction. And after I read some of these scriptures, I will go into the prophetic word, the direct message that God gave me for Israel. This is Isaiah 1. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water, your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore the Lord says, The Lord of hosts, the Mighty One of Israel, Ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired, and you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tinder, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. Now, it says in verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be, you shall be devoured by the sword. Now at this time, the wickedness of Judah was attributed to its disobedience to God's law. But since this book was written, God fulfilled the law through Jesus Christ, through the blood atonement sacrifice of the Lamb of God for the iniquities of not just Israel, but all of us, all who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our need for a Savior who profess that he is Messiah and call him Lord are saved, are grafted into Israel. And we will shortly get into the scripture where God blinds Israel from being able to receive Jesus Christ, Yahushua HaMashiach, Yeshua, as Messiah. But he will open her eyes, once the fullness of the Gentiles, non-Israelites, come to salvation. The salvation through the blood of Jesus, which is the only way to be reconciled to God, a holy God. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses our sins like scarlet to make them white as snow. 
and as wool. Jesus came to rend the veil. He tore the veil of the law that separates us from God under the new covenant. And so we are not saved by our works or by our law keeping, but through the perfect righteousness of Jesus on our behalf, who paid our debt, the debt for our disobedience. And so in the new covenant, and so in the new covenant, our obedience to God flows out of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that dwells within us when we have saving faith in Jesus Christ, Messiah. Our works and our obedience are a response to our saving faith. They do not earn our chosenness, our salvation, our forgiveness. We can't earn it. But those who love God, him obey his commandments and as scripture says his commandments are not burdensome and this veil that god has placed over israel is one of the reasons why they have this these books of the old testament that prophesy jesus like isaiah 53 describes the messiah that they have rejected and because they are blind They still cannot see, except for those in whom God chooses to have mercy upon, and the Holy Spirit opens their eyes, and um, they do. There are, you know, Christian or Messianic Jewish people who are not still waiting for the Messiah to come. They are waiting for the Messiah that has come and will come again, Jesus Christ, who is returning with a rod of iron to judge the world. And those who are still waiting for the Messiah to come will be waiting, will be receiving the Antichrist, which is not necessarily a word that means against Christ, but instead of. Isaiah 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And then it goes, so it's talking about the future house of God. And then here it goes into the day of the Lord. O house of Jacob, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures." Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to the chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and each man humbles himself. Therefore do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the beautiful sloops, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. And so God continues to lay before Israel her sins that she is guilty of. Let's continue with Isaiah 5, starting 8. Impending judgment on excesses. Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. 
In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones, without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one epa. Epha. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure, their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture, and in the waste places of the fat ones strangers shall eat. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as if a cart rope, and sin as if with a cart rope, that say, Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the streets." For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar, and will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loosed, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp and their bows bent. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of their prey. They will carry it away safely, and no one will deliver. In that day they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea, and if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by the clouds. So you can see how God uses this pattern in scripture specifically with israel of loosing upon her adversaries and oppressors to to chasten and convict and purge israel he eventually turns to do the same thing in babylon but god always starts with his own house in chapter 13, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible." I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of a fear. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger, it shall be hunted as the gazelle, and as a sheep that no man takes up. Every man will turn to his own people, and every one will flee to his own land. Every one who is found will be thrust through, and every one who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children will also be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. 
and Babylon, it says a little further down the passage, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So as God sends this purging fire through his house, through the house of Israel, through the nations, through Babylon, and I believe that mystery Babylon is America, but that's a whole other video. As God is sending the sword, this purging fire and the hammer and the gavel of his judgment, the response of our hearts must be repentance. God is calling people to repent, to call on him, to repent of idolatry and to trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins, to stop ignoring him, to stop cheating on him with greater affections and greater obedience to man and self and the flesh and sin and this world than to him the fearsome, almighty, and terrible one who laid down his life, his very life, that we may be reconciled to his holiness, us filthy sinners, washed completely clean, declared perfect through the blood atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through, through faith in him. But yet, many believe that they don't need it. They don't need Jesus. They, they, that they are reconciled to God through their own judgments of what makes a person good. When God says none are worthy, none are good, but him. And that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We cannot go around the narrow gate. We cannot go under the narrow gate of Jesus. We cannot go over it. There is no way except through Jesus to be redeemed, forgiven, and saved. This is the way. There is one way, Israel. There is one way through God's only begotten Son who laid down his life for you. For greater love has no one than this, than a man who has laid down his life for his friends. The sin-bearing servant presented to you in your very own scripture. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred. So his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what they had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Isaiah 53, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. Ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All, we like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, 
yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And he is still making intercession for us. He is still making intercession for the transgression of Israel who has denied him, rejected him, crucified him. And who now has a veil over their eyes as a consequence. God has blinded them from seeing their Savior. But God has promised that in the end, all of Israel will be saved through faith in Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yahushua HaMashiach, the one who died on the cross for our sins against him. But between now and then, God will choose to have mercy on select individuals, on a remnant of Israel, He will open the eyes of certain individuals through passages like Isaiah 53, through dreams or through visions, through sermons, through evangelists, through messages like this. Through messages like this, he is still saving people every day, both Gentiles and Jews, grafted in together to make one spiritual Israel, one house of God. Romans 9 talks about the rejection of Christ by Israel and the seed of Abraham and the word of promise and God's purposes. But he says that not all of Israel is Israel. It is not therefore genetics that make one a child of God. It's faith in the Christ. The good news of the Messiah, the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, has on a whole been rejected by Israel. Romans 10 discusses this. And when we reject the gospel, when we reject the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, we reject God. The scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For therefore, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 11 and 12 and 13. But Israel rejects the gospel, and God says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And so he opens up his kingdom, the narrow gate of Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles. Romans 11 explains God's response to Israel's rejection of Messiah. Verse 7 Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, 
eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. He does the same thing in Isaiah 6. Where God says to Isaiah, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy. And God says the same thing to Israel in Isaiah 6. He says to Isaiah, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. And then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. And many hear these kinds of scriptures and say, well, that's not fair. How is that just? And God addresses this in regards to his justice in Romans chapter 9, Israel's rejection and God's justice. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Says Paul. Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not out of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to say, Who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and one for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles? And so what Paul is calling us to here is to look at our lives not from a sense of entitlement, but from the perspective of God's mercy because our baseline as human beings as sinners is hell and wrath and an eternity of torment that is what our sins deserve against a holy God but God in his mercy and in wanting to show the riches of his grace provided for us a single one way out through Jesus And we have to remember that our sense of justice is a fallen sense of justice as fallen human beings. But God in his higher, infinite wisdom calls us to both reason through this and also to trust him. All of this is for the purpose of making known the riches of his glory and the goodness of his mercy his exceeding and abundant grace is known to us through Jesus, through what he did for us. If we want to know God, we just have to turn to Jesus. He is God and he is the son of God. He is the radiation, the radiance He is the radiance of the Father. He's not distant, up on some lofty cloud, observing from afar, disinterested and detached from the intimate 
parts of our lives, our thoughts, our bodies, our hearts, our pain, our suffering, our sorrow, our desires. He made us for relationship with him. He made us for relationship with him. And that only comes through Jesus. You can't have relationship with somebody through a wall or through the lattice of a fence. You have to go through the gate, the narrow gate of Jesus Christ. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens it, I will come in to eat with him, to dine with him and he with me. He comes to dwell in us, in us as the temple of God, which is our bodies. And then we are also indwelling in him at the same time. We become each other's homes. And so, Moya, 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 bitter rebellion, bitter rebellion, bitter rebellion. Yaka, conviction, appointing, chastening at the biblical location of the ruin heap. Shul, synagogue. According to the Hebrew words that I received in this prophetic utterance, God is convicting the synagogue for its bitter rebellion Moya and rejection of the truth, Ta, and so is becoming once again as the ruin heap of Aya at Atel on West Bank. Hear the word of the Lord, O Israel. The three other words that God gave me in this prophetic utterance in Hebrew are Eliah, which is Elijah, which means my God is Yahweh, Chala, and Na, as well as Naya. And the Lord revealed the meaning of this to me very quickly, which I will touch on briefly. The spirit of Elijah, according to Malachi 4, is returning before the great and awesome day of the Lord. It says he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter desolation. Luke 1.17 And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, this is referring to John the Baptist, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so the spirit of Elijah is upon the remnant seed of much of God's household to bring about repentance and reconciliation to the house of God through Jesus Christ and with each other in unity. The spirit of Elijah, the Elijah that came in First and Second Kings, came again through John the Baptist in early New Testament and is coming a third time in these end times and is here now calling nations to repentance. The same message that the spirit of Elijah has always been crying in the wilderness, make straight a road in the highway for the coming of our Lord, our King. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Na means to beseech or pray or to, you know, say please. And so this is the spirit of Elijah petitioning and beseeching Israel on behalf of God. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. As the, as the Savior and blood atonement for your sins. 
then you will be given naya. He said naya, new life, renewal. And the final word, which is challah. It's a Jewish braided sweet bread usually enjoyed during Shabbat or Sabbath as a weekly celebration of rest. In the Bible, bread symbolizes provision from the Lord. God provided manna or bread from heaven for the people of Israel while they were in the desert. On the sixth day of the week, Friday, God provided twice as much of the manna so that the people of Israel could rest from work on the Sabbath. God provided more than they needed in order to show his abundance and provision to his people. In Numbers 15, 18 to 21, we see the first reference in the Bible to challah or cake. It says, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land to which I bring you, and when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall present a contribution to the Lord. Of the first of your dough, you shall present a loaf as a contribution, like a contribution from the threshing floor, so shall you present it. Some of the first of your dough you shall give to the Lord as a contribution throughout your generations. So we see in this passage that some of this bread that was presented to the Lord in his tabernacle or temple was to be holy. And bread continues to be an important part of the Bible in the New Testament, in the New Covenant as well. Specifically in Mark 14, verse 24, Verse 22 to 25, Jesus broke bread and drank wine with his disciples, symbolizing his death on the cross in provision for their sins. So bread continues to be a representation of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in communion. So this term, challah, comes from the phrase separating bread, representing this tradition of the Jewish people all the way back to the first and second temples in Jerusalem, where they would rip off a portion of the dough before they braided it as a sacrifice to the Lord. So it became a tradition during Sabbath dinner in order to present the provision God gave to his people in the wilderness, and the tradition continues today. Chala is made into two loaves representing, representing the double portion God gave to his people. And it is braided so it has 12 humps representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 loaves of holy bread in the tabernacle. And it's braided in three strands to symbolize unity, peace, and love because they look like arms intertwined. And in addition to that, the Lord gave me the word Shema, which means to hear and obey. The Hebrew word Shema is used in Deuteronomy 6. Verse 3, Hear Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in the Hebrew, the word to hear um, and listen is synonymous with the word obey. And I think that is really important because God does not consider us to have heard his word if we are not obeying it. To hear is, a, is, is not a passive verb in Hebrew. It is, according to this word Shema, an active, ver an active verb. It re it requires a response, an action. So you haven't received faith by hearing the word of the Lord unless you are also obeying the word of the Lord as well. Those words are intertwined together. And so that's why I don't like to get into debates with people about faith versus works or works versus faith and works-based salvation or grace-based salvation because of the word faith without works is dead. That is a relationship that relates to this word Shema. It's like two sides of the same swinging door. One side is faith, the other side is works. You can't have faith without works. And your works do not count for anything unless they're coming from a place of faith in Jesus. So I think that that argument is better put to rest by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf and his grace and letting the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to 
cause us to love his commandments and perform obedience. So this bread represents, according to the new covenant, the Sabbath rest that was purchased for us through Yahushua HaMashiach. And those who reject his sacrifice have not, according to his word, entered into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4 reads, verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from him, from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give the account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so this is a call for both Jews and Gentiles alike to enter in to the rest designated by God through Jesus Christ where we cease from striving to earn salvation and we simply accept it as his gift the blood of the lamb is a gift and we can't earn it by law keeping or by works or by being a good person by our own summation or the world's estimates God's standard is perfection. And there is only one perfect. And that's Yeshua, the Messiah. And we inherit his perfection and are therefore redeemed back into unity and oneness with God the Father by confessing and believing in the truth that Jesus Christ, Yahushua HaMashiach, the Aleph and the Taf, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is King. There will be no peace outside of him for Israel or this world. There will come a lawless one, the man of sin, prophesied in the book of Daniel, Second Thessalonians, and Revelation, and certain parts of Isaiah as well, who will claim to bring peace and safety to the nation of Israel and to the world. 
and those of Israel, those who are Jewish, who will continue to remain under the veil and blindness that God has ordained for them, will receive this man as the anticipated Messiah, and he will lead them to destruction. The word of God says in Revelation that he will come, him and the false prophet will come, hawking like a lamb, looking like a lamb, but speaking blasphemies against the Most High God. And those who do not know the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit will not know better. They may believe that he is the Christ. The Bible says to be aware that many will come in his name. And to not be deceived. When Jesus returns as the king to set up his throne on the earth, and he's not going to come with the same meekness of the lamb that died upon the cross, He's coming, according to his word, with many crowns and a robe dipped in blood, riding on a white horse with legs of bronze, eyes of flame of fire, and a rod of iron to judge the nations and all people according to what they have done. The Bible says that the God of this world, little g God of this world, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot hear, understand, or receive the truth and that the gospel message the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ the gift of salvation is foolishness to those who are perishing but God does not wish that anyone should perish but that all should come to repentance so I pray I am praying for all who come across this message today because I know that Almighty God, who is sovereign and who loves you, has led you here to give you a chance to repent because his mercy will not be brought into reproach by anybody's choice to remain in sin and ignorance and therefore perish. He is too good and too loving and too righteous and too just and you only need to look as far as a savior on the cross to know how much this God that made you loves you. That he gave his one and only son, his one and only begotten son, to pay your debt so that you could go free and not just go free of the death and the eternal hell and wrath and judgment that our sins deserve, but to share in the inheritance of his son, Jesus Christ, the inheritance of a kingdom, eternal life, adoption into sonship by the most high God, chosen, elected, redeemed, forgiven, exalted through him. Listen, I know it's not a coincidence that God has given me the gift of prophetic utterance in Hebrew or Aramaic, and even on occasions Yiddish. I have had a burden from the Lord in my spirit, on my heart, for Israel, for the Jewish people, for quite some time. That's the spirit of God within me. That makes intercession for the people of Israel to receive the Messiah that was designated for them and to come out of the captivity and blindness of the law and of iniquity and of sin and into his freedom. The Hebrew language is so beautiful and rich and poetic. And because of ancient Hebrew culture, and Jewish culture and the Hebrew language, I have gained such a profound 
appreciation for who God is and who he is to Israel, who he is to this people and to the nations. And I am at a loss for words to express how grateful and in awe I am and amazed that I have been invited into this inheritance, into the promise, into God's promise through Israel by faith in Messiah. I don't deserve it. And God in his grace and mercy has relieved me from trying to. I don't need to. My place in Israel in the new Jerusalem was purchased for me on the cross and purchased for you too. If Jesus Christ is your Lord. And this is the word of the Lord that God gave me for Israel. Behold your God, Israel. Behold me with an unveiled face. Behold your Messiah, Yahushua, Yeshua. My word made flesh who dwelt among you and who was crucified and rose again to redeem and reconcile you to me. Call on me through the spotless lamb who was slain for your sin. Yeshua is the remover of the veil of the law. Isaiah 6. The law that keeps you from my presence because you cannot fulfill it perfectly, and none are righteous, none are holy but me. All have sinned, all fall short of my glory. Look upon my Son, the spotless Lamb who made atonement for a spotted people. He has removed every blemish of iniquity from you so that you can be reconciled to me. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Messiah that you have waited for has come and was slain and rose again. He will return according to my holy word, but not as one whom the world will receive with open arms, but as the cornerstone that the builders have rejected, the one that I have made the chief cornerstone. He is returning with a rod of iron to judge the nations and bring vengeance upon the wicked as an awesome and terrible one. My chosen are behind him. Those redeemed from sin through faith in Messiah are granted forgiveness and eternal life. My people, my Zion, my Israel, I am collecting you from the four corners of the earth where you are scattered to bring you to my holy mountain. Isaiah 2 The rock from which you were cut and the quarry from which you were hewn. The new Jerusalem, my temple where my spirit dwells and those who are called by my name. Cry out to me, Israel. No one can save you. No one else can save you but I. For I alone am sovereign, righteous, and merciful. Call upon your Savior, and I will hear you. Call upon the risen Lamb, and I will save you. Adorn you, exalt you, and give you peace. Then all will know that I am the Lord. Signed, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord Jesus Christ.